Hello, everybody. I'm going to talk today about a topic that only pops up from time to time on the channel, but which occupies my mind quite a bit, actually, the climate. As always, during the Northern Hemisphere summer, we've seen quite a few headlines about uh, weather extremes. We've had, for example, heat waves in Europe and China. We've had a rare uh, tropical cyclone over southwestern United States. And we've had severe wildfires in Canada and Hawaii and other places. One climate disaster after another, said President Biden's clean energy uh, advisor. Heat waves, drought, flooding, and more intense storms are directly linked to climate change, said a senior scientist at a climate research center in Massachusetts. I'm sure you're familiar with statements and headlines like these all the time, like most of us are. So has everybody who conveys that kind of message examined the trends? What does the science and the statistics say about extreme weather events? Let's see what the latest scientific assessment from the U United Nations climate change outfit, the IPCC, says. So, out of 13 types of extreme weather, 13 types, an increase is clear, sorry, an increase is clear in two and is probable in another two. As for the other nine, no trend has been detected. So let's begin with the ones where an increase has been detected. One, we see more hot days and fewer cold days. This is very logical considering that the global mean temperature has increased by some 1.2 degrees Celsius since the 19th century. So heat waves are a bit more intense and possibly also more common, although that is a, a matter of, of uh, definition. And cold spells are a bit less cold and possibly also less common. Two, we see more extreme precipitation, mostly meaning heavier downpours. This is also fairly logical, since air can contain more moisture the hotter it is. Now, although this trend is fairly clear on a global uh, level, uh, as a global average, it hasn't been detected in exactly all regions, actually. Three, there is a 50-50 chance that what is called fire weather has increased. That's basically a combination of hot and dry weather conditions. The IPCC has realized that it's pointless to, to keep track of the number of wildfires since there are dozens of underlying reasons why a wildfire starts. So, and over the long term, also interesting to, to note that over the very long term, we talk about centuries, uh, wildfires have decreased. They have decreased significantly all over the globe. In recent decades, say two or three decades back, and, and uh, like from the 80s onwards, they have increased, increased, <laughs> maybe it's the way to pronounce it, in some places, like United States, especially the Western United States and Australia, but they have decreased slightly, believe it or not, in some other regions, for example, Southern Europe, actually. So it's a mixed bag. Four, there is a 50-50 chance that what is called ecological and agricultural drought has increased. This is a type of uh, drought that doesn't necessarily have to do with major changes in, in the weather, weather patterns. Um, it's a measure of soil moisture, and it is associated with human activity. That's it. So let's address the rest. Hydrological and meteorological drought, that is what we normally refer to when we talk about drought, has not been proven to increase. Flooding, also no increase, which is perhaps a little bit counterintuitive since I just mentioned that extreme precipitation has increased. But the reason is that floods are determined by other factors than singular downpours and also by the fact that, say, a meek 40 millimeter rain 
in a normally very dry area is also defined as an event of extreme precipitation. And that kind of rainfall doesn't cause flooding. Tropical cyclones, no increase. Other storms, no increase. Extreme winds, no increase. Thunderstorms, no increase. Lightning strikes, no increase. Uh, tornadoes, no increase. Hail, no increase. So, as you can understand, many headlines and many statements, even by scientists, lack scientific support. You can hear astounding examples at any level, like um, climate activist Greta Thunberg asking for a moment of silence for all of those people who have died in the quote-unquote climate disaster, when in fact fewer people than ever die from uh, weather disasters today. Or United Nations boss Antonio Guterres, Guterres uh, saying that the world has gone from global warming to quote-unquote global boiling, when in fact the warming for forecast done by his own organization has been lowered significantly. Many otherwise sensible and wise people seem to buy this bleak message wholesale. Maybe it fits their view of humanity. Who knows? Of course, it is a bit cumbersome to check the facts for yourself. Now, does what I just explained here mean that most weather extremes will never increase? No, it doesn't. But it has been wrongly predicted for decades now that many of these phenomena that we're talking about here will increase, such as storms, floods, and meteorological drought. So the likelihood of a dramatic increase anytime soon should be pretty low. Now, this year, 2023, and the beginning of next year also probably, we could actually see more extreme weather events than we normally do because we are at the beginning stages of, an, of a so-called El Nino phase. That's a weather phenomenon which always jacks up the global temperature and causes disruptions in some weather patterns. So to sum up, we have a problem with global warming, but it's not the end of the world, which is why we should solve this problem wisely and with consideration of both nature and the human population. And the solution is not only about changing the way we produce energy, but it is also about adapting to new conditions, which we have always done and been, been able to do. By the way, it's actually self-evident when you think about it, that some warming and some increase uh, of CO2 levels also have some positive effects, like uh, faster growing plants, expanded habitats for, for many species, and fewer deaths from cold, which kills by far more, kills far more people than heat does. But you won't hear much about that aspect. Humans have obviously increased the level of CO2 in the atmosphere. There's no question about that. Now, exactly to what extent that extra CO2 contributes to the warming that we experience is not fully known, although it seems that way when you listen to politicians and journalists. There's a whole subdivision, subdiscipline in climate science that deals with what is called attribution. How likely is it that a particular weather, uh, extreme weather event would have happened without human emissions? Needless to say, it is crazy difficult to assess. I personally think that the mechanical, pretty mechanical way that, that uh, in, in which global warming and its possible and known effects are described it's not only a bit anti-nature, but it's also, by extension, quite a bit anti-human, actually. Does it really matter that much, exactly how much humans are to blame for it? I mean, if in a couple of decades, say, scientists begin to agree that the warming actually seems to mainly have been a natural variation, we will still have to adapt in various ways. I mean, it's not that the climate would make a 180 turn if we stopped uh, using fossil fuels tomorrow anyway. I mean, these are long processes. So the planet has become warmer. We can deal with the warming we've seen, obviously, 
plus a bit more. And so can plants and so can animals. It is a bit arrogant to think that humans are so much more powerful and so much more resilient than Mother Earth, which we are a part of, by the way, that only we can induce global warming and only we can adapt, no other species. Judging from geological records and, and many other historical records, the planet and its inhabitants is fully capable of both. Again, where should we place our focus? On shaming and blaming or on solving and adjusting? We have this situation. It's arguably not our biggest challenge. I'm pretty sure we and our planet are fully capable of dealing with this. Thank you. Bye.